Welcome back to another episode of The Untold Whisperer. This time I've got something really special for you. I'm sharing personal stories that will give you a glimpse into the eerie encounters from my own life. Get ready to join me on a thrilling journey as I recount the time I came face to face with a mysterious dark figure in my childhood room, battled through a sleep paralysis experience and encountered a surprising twist during a memorable bike ride. So sit back, relax, and let's dive into these captivating tales of fear, mystery, and the unexplained. The Unseen Tenant, A Childhood Encounter You know how you have those experiences? The ones that stick with you, regardless of how much time has passed. Well, let me tell you about one of mine, something that happened when I was about 10 or 11. So we used to live in this tiny town, almost a speck on the map. Six flats in a single block, that was all, nestled amidst other small blocks, a local high school and a small grocery store. I mean, it was small. It was the kind of place where everybody knew everybody, you know? My younger brother and I shared a room in our small flat, a big room with unusually high ceilings. The ceilings were so tall that our furniture, however high, always seemed dwarfed. This one time I remember standing on my tiptoes, trying to reach the top shelf of our wooden bookcase and still falling short by a mile. Oh, and we had this massive wooden desk right by the window. Almost covered half of the width of the floor, that thing did. One night, a strange disturbance woke me up. It was an odd sound, like almost inaudible, like someone shuffling around on our carpeted floor. Our floors were quiet, no squeaky floorboards, nothing. But the carpet, man, it had a distinct sound when someone walked on it especially in a dead, quiet room in the middle of the night. I was terrified. I mean, I was frozen with fear, too scared to even peek out from under the duvet. Then the heavy breathing started. So I'm laying there, right? Just terrified out of my mind, and the breathing gets heavier, more ragged. It sounds angry, I guess. I don't know, it's hard to describe, but it's freaking me out. And I know I need to look, I have to see what's going on. So I muster every bit of courage a 10 year old can have and I open my eyes. What I saw? It's forever etched in my mind. There, leaning against our gigantic desk was this towering dark figure. I mean, this thing was massive, right? So big it seemed to fill the room, and it's just standing there, silent and unmoving. Its eyes, though, they were glowing, glowing a fiery devilish red. I couldn't look away, I was paralyzed by fear. I don't know how long I stared at it, probably just a split second, but it felt like forever. Then. Like a snap, I blinked and it was gone. Poof. Just like that. And I'm there, shivering in my bed, too scared to even breathe. I clamped my eyes shut, muttered a few half-remembered prayers under my breath, and somehow drifted off to sleep. Alright, so the next day I wake up, right? And the room is just normal. No sign of the creepy figure from last night. No signs of any disturbance. Like it was all just a nightmare. I even asked my dad if he'd come into our room last night and he just gave me this puzzled look. Said he hadn't. Now, I'm just a kid, right? I got distracted easily. Days turned into weeks and weeks into months. And soon enough, 
I forgot about that frightful night. The memory faded, became fuzzy, like the way a dream does when you wake up. But then something happened. A few months later, we were moving out of the flat, you see. It was a big deal. Packing up our stuff, saying goodbye to our friends and neighbors, and as we were clearing out the room, we moved the massive desk that sat by the window. And there, on the floor, was something that made my heart stop. So we are moving this big old desk, right? And there, on the floor, where the desk stood all these months, was a mark. Not just any mark. It was burned into the carpet, seared right in. It was a hoof mark, a giant, unmistakable hoof mark. I mean, it was massive, easily ten inches wide. My dad looked puzzled, said it must have been something with the desk, but I could see he was a little unsettled too. But me? I remembered. I remembered that towering figure with glowing red eyes. That fear, the helplessness, it all came rushing back. The memory was as vivid as if it happened the night before. I just stood there, staring at the mark. My mind was racing. I was scared, sure, but more than that, I was fascinated. I mean, what was the creature? Was it even real? Or was it all just a product of a kid's overactive imagination? I guess I'll never know. All I have now is a story and a memory that'll probably haunt me till the day I die. And that's it. That's the story of the strange, eerie occurrence that happened to me when I was just a kid. I still think about it sometimes. Makes you wonder, doesn't it? Just how many things are there in this world that we don't understand, that we can't explain. Whispers in the shadows, one creaky night. You know that feeling when you're not alone, even though you technically are? Yeah, that was me, one freaky night. I'd recently moved into a small two-bedroom flat on the fringes of the city. An older building, the kind that creaks and groans when it settles in for the night. My flat was modest, but cozy, with a kitchen-living-room combo that made up most of the space. You walked into a decent-sized hall with a walk-in cupboard large enough to double as a small office. My new space echoed with emptiness as I'd moved in all alone after a pretty nasty breakup. That week, life had been a whirlwind. I was working on this colossal movie set tinkering with sound systems, miking up actors and ensuring that every emotion, every hushed whisper was captured to perfection. Late nights bled into early mornings and exhaustion clung to me like an unwelcome shadow. One night I found myself crawling back home at 2am, utterly beat. A hot shower later, the moment my head hit the pillow, my phone blared to life. It was Sam, my colleague and friend, locked in the office because yours truly had locked him in. I'd turned the key twice instead of once, and now he was trapped. So, back into the car, and off into the city center I went, sacrificing another hour of precious sleep. I remember the city lights flashing past, the buildings blurring into abstract shapes, in my sleep-deprived state. It was a little past 3 a.m. when I stumbled back into my flat. The dark corners of my home were strangely unfamiliar in my foggy state, like I was seeing them for the first time. With an effort that felt monumental, I slipped back under the covers, praying for uninterrupted sleep. The moment my head touched the pillow, I was out cold. And then something strange happened. I woke up. I remember it vividly, you see. The dull thud of my heart in my chest, 
The soft rustling of the sheets as I shifted, I heard something strange, indistinct noises from the hall. I tried to sit up, to listen closely, but I was stuck, immobilized. My body refused to obey my commands, my muscles frozen as if encased in ice. Panic flared, hot and urgent, but I could do nothing but stare at the ceiling, eyes wide open. Then the voices started, low, murmuring sounds that seemed to ebb and flow from the direction of the hall. I tried to make out the words, but they were like whispers carried away by the wind. The lamplight from outside bathed the room in an eerie orange glow, painting long, dancing shadows on the walls. I could see the open doorway to the hall, but nothing beyond it, nothing but a churning sea of darkness and those indistinct, whispering voices. With each passing second, my mind churned with confusion, terror and disbelief. There I was, lying motionless in my bed, paralyzed by some invisible force, as shadows moved and voices whispered in the darkness outside my room. I felt a primal terror cursing through me, the kind that reduces one to a shivering, helpless creature. Yet, as strange and terrifying as the voices were, the real horror was in the immobilization. The utter inability to move, not even to twitch a finger or blink. My mind screamed commands at my body to run, to hide, to do something, but it was like shouting into a void. There was no response, just a terrifying silence. Then the voices grew louder, their incoherent whispers morphing into a symphony of sound that resonated in my brain. They felt both distant and painfully close, like some radio frequency that I was tuned into against my will. The faint shadows in the hall seemed to move and twist more violently now, their forms grotesque and alien. And all the while, the orange glow of lamp painted my room in a macabre tableau, the dancing shadows seeming to whisper their own dreadful tales. Fear spiked through me, chilling and raw. And just like that, after what felt like an eternity, my senses blurred. The voices receded into a faint hum, the dancing shadows merging into the darkness. The world around me seemed to soften, and the grip of terror began to loosen. My eyes felt heavy, as if they were being gently pushed shut, and then I was falling back into the cavernous depths of sleep. I woke up with a start, drenched in cold sweat. The morning sun had turned the curtains into a glowing orange canvas. The shadows of the night dissolved under its brilliant rays. I looked at the clock on my bedside table. It was almost one in the afternoon. That morning, as I sat on the edge of my bed, sunlight washing over me, I tried to shake off the remnants of that terrible night. My room was quiet, serene even. The whispering voices and moving shadows felt like a distant dream, but the fear? The fear still clung to me, icy and relentless. So yeah, that's it. My one encounter with sleep paralysis. It's an experience I wouldn't wish on my worst enemy. A bizarre blurring of reality and nightmare that leaves you questioning your sanity. It's funny, you know, how we consider our homes, our safe spaces, our sanctuaries. But that night, every creaking floorboard, every dancing shadow became an unknown threat. My home turning into a stage for my deepest fears. I've had many sleepless nights since, 
but nothing quite matches the terror of that night. The night I woke up, but couldn't move. The night when I heard the whispers and saw the shadows. That one freaky night. The Wild Chase An Encounter in Wilderness Park The sky was belching out anger when I finally hit the road back home. A tempestuous day it was, the storm's tantrum leaving a trail of devastation. It ripped trees apart, tossing them onto power lines, while floods made mockery of our usual paths. But hell, that's nature for you. Despite it all, I was home by evening, with the skies clearing up just in time. You see, my bike was my world. Every bolt, every part, I could tell their stories in my sleep. So there I was, gearing up for an evening ride. Wilderness Park. You know that place? Massive forest expanse, home to boars, deer, moose, vipers, you name it. Even the silence is alive, only interrupted by the forest's own symphony. Kind of like a secret realm tucked away from the world, I would say. Anyway, I started off around 6 p.m. Checked the bike, lights, water, spare tubes, standard procedure. The damage from the storm was still visible. Emergency services were buzzing around, trying to put things back together. That should have been a warning, but the beckoning of the clear skies and the wild was too strong. All right. Here's a bit of cheese. I've got this training playlist on Spotify that begins with the war track from Rocky IV. Laugh all you want, but that stuff just gets you going. I had this particular route about 45 kilometers into the wilderness. Roughly three hours of pure cycling bliss, give or take. This time though, I had to reroute because of the fallen trees and storm damage. But the detour didn't add much time. About halfway through, I always took a break in this particular spot. Now, this place, it's something out of a fairy tale. The track opens up from the dense forest, the sides bursting with fields of freshly cut tree trunks and young saplings. A gentle mist always seemed to linger over the wet grass, making it a serene sight. Honestly, I'd often lose track of time just taking in the beauty of it all. But it was around 8 p.m. and I had another 20 kilometers to go. I'd been feeling pretty worn out already. Guess I'd overestimated my stamina after the long drive back from the sea. Anyway. I took my last sip of water, hoping to recharge a bit. And then it hit me. I had to ride the same 20 kilometers back. A strange mix of exhaustion and exhilaration washed over me. And then the journey back began. As I pushed deeper into the wilderness, the forest canopy above swallowed the remaining daylight. It was like stepping into another world. My bike lights barely cut through the darkness, illuminating just a few meters ahead. But it didn't deter me. I had about 15 kilometers left. No big deal, right? I could hear the smooth crunch of the gravel under my tires, the quiet rustling of the leaves, my own breathing, and nothing more. Now, if you've ever ridden at night, you'll know that everything sort of narrows down to this tunnel, just you, the bike, and the patch of light ahead. As I was making my way through this pine grove, this eerie, almost sacred spot, I heard a branch snap. I stopped immediately, balancing myself on the bike, trying to locate the source of the sound. And then I saw them. 
A pair of towering figures lurking in the shadows, their eyes reflecting the bike's light back at me. For a moment, I thought they were dogs. But the realization hit me like a punch in the gut. They were wolves. Just a few meters away from me, still as statues, their gaze fixed on me. I froze for a split second, an eternity in that moment, my heart pounding in my chest. Then instinct kicked in, or was it fear? I don't know, but I decided to run, well, ride like the wind to be precise. I pushed off the ground and pedaled like never before, shifting gears faster than a rally car driver, if I may add. I didn't look back, didn't want to, but I could hear them, their howls piercing the silence, the thump of their paws hitting the ground, they were chasing me. My heart was thundering in my chest, adrenaline pumping through my veins like liquid fire. My muscles screamed for rest, but fear spurred me on. Every snap of a twig, every rustle of leaves, they all sounded like impending doom. Despite the terror, I made it back home safely, probably smashing my best time record along with a few world ones. I had never pedaled that fast, that hard in my life. When I finally skid into my driveway, I was exhausted, shaking, but safe. I dismounted my bike, letting it clatter onto the driveway as I dropped onto the grass staring up at the clear night sky. The peaceful twinkling stars felt so dissonant with the raw terror that was still pounding in my veins. I spent the rest of that summer running closer to home. The memory of the close encounter still sent chills down my spine every time I heard something in the woods. But it has also made me wiser, more aware. Now I write without my playlist. I prefer to hear what's going on around me, especially when I'm in the peaceful, misty forest closer to home. That's my story. Scary as hell, but well, that's the thrill of it, isn't it? And with that, my dear listeners, we reach the conclusion of this captivating chapter. If these stories have stirred something within you, I encourage you to share your own tales of the unexplained in the comments below. Your experiences deserve to be heard. Keep that curiosity alive, stay vigilant, and as always, stay untold. This is the Untold Whisperer, signing off.